quantic quantum randomness in a second. Cool. Perfect. Okay, cool. Can you hear me? Excellent. Right, so this is a match talk of uh, two papers which essentially share the same um, authorship uh, set. So this is me, Rodrigo, Jens, Henrik, and Marcus who joined for the second project. From our point of view, um, there's sort of a clear logical uh, sort of narrative between these two projects, even though when we wrote up those papers, um, we kind of emphasize different aspects. So I'm going to be you know, talking about the two quite separately, but try and make sure that um, you understand why these two should be sort of, you know, why it's reasonable for them to be part of a match talks and what they have in common. So let's uh, start with the first, uh, catalytic quantum randomness. What were the guiding questions we had? Um, two, uh, the first is what's the least amount of randomness required to implement state transitions between quantum states and noisy processes? So noisy processes, randomness of some kind is ubiquitous, uh, useful, not useful, uh, in all kinds of ways. And we thought that it's reasonable to ask, well, can we somehow limit the amount of randomness in some meaningful sense required to implement noisy processes? And a follow-up question um, in developing an answer to the first is, is there a difference between the answer to the question when you have quantum and classical randomness, again, in some meaningful sense. So what, what do I mean by these? Um, classical randomness here will be something where I essentially think of sets of unitaries that define a random unitary channel. So I'm going to be writing uh, that rho in the initial state can be brought to a final state rho prime using m classical randomness if uh, there exists a set of m unitaries such that you know, sort of uniformly applying uh, them yields the final state. And I'm going to be saying that a transition using m amounts of quantum randomness as possible, if there exists a single unitary that I now apply to the initial state, now together with an ancillary system, sort of the source of randomness R, that is initially in a maximally mixed state, such that I apply, if I apply the unitary and I trace out this ancillary system, I end up with the final state. So this is going to be quantum randomness. Why? Because somehow here I model the fact that my source of randomness is itself a quantum system, has quantum degrees of freedom that I can access using this um, global unitary. And if I'm interested in the differences in the power of these two kinds of models of un uh, randomness, then a first um, note is that if I wasn't interested in this, the amount, the total amount, but if I gave myself access to any amount of randomness, any number of unitaries, any um, dimension of the sensory system in the quantum case, then there wouldn't be any difference. Because it's sort of quite well known that both of these are characterized by the relationship of majorization, um, which was essentially introduced into sort of the field by, by Nielsen in his uh, famous theorem concerning the characterization of uh, state transitions of pure bipartite states under LOCC, but since then has also been you know, used in other fields, particularly resource theories and, and the like. Okay, so, but here we are interested in um, the uh, differing powers of these two models. Uh, why? Well, I'm gonna give you two, uh, three reasons. The first is that in the past, people have successfully been able to operationally characterize a number of sort of key quantities in quantum information theory asking this kind of question. So maybe most uh, well known is this result by Groisman at al from 2005 where they asked what's the number, what's the least, what's the number of unitaries that I need to given a bipartite state, some correlated state, to decouple the two parts by acting uh, with a random unitary channel on one of them then asymptotically this number of unitaries, uh, or the, sort of the rate of it, is given by the mutual information. So there's an operational characterization of the mutual information. And similarly, these other sort of more single shot quantities 
could, have, uh, could, have, could be characterized or have been characterized in asking similar questions. Um, more generally, you know, we might be interesting, I mean, we all have interest in separation results here. Most people um, uh, are interested in sort of quantum arithmetic separation results, but you could also ask, well, you know, if I have randomness, I have these two modes of randomness, how do they differ in power? For example, people, I mean, Hale et al. in 2015 have sort of studied these coins and showed that you could produce biased, uh, you could produce sort of distributions of biased coins using these coins in a way that you couldn't do classically. So maybe there's something to gain here as well. And the third uh, motivation is that this quantum randomness setting where you dilate your system um, or your, your random unitary channel into something that is an ancilla and a maximum mixed state and you have global unitary interaction, you look at what happens locally, acts as a kind of toy model for quantum thermodynamics where we're interested in the evolution of systems of equilibration, thermalization and these kinds um, uh, in, in, in quantum statistical mechanics and so this kind of setting could also be useful in helping us understand that. Okay, so back to the question. Um, what, we, what we're settling for here is in particular this question. What is the least amount of randomness required to implement any transition for a fixed dimension? So this is this quantity here, um, essentially m star of x, where x could now be a subscript q or a subscript c, is the smallest number such that any transition that would have been possible using sort of classical or quantum randomness with unbounded resources is possible with at most this much randomness, right? So you come to me with any transition that is possible with any amount of randomness, classically or quantumly, and I tell you, well, you won't need more than m, right? I'm interested in this number as a function of the dimension of the, um, you know, of the system on which, of the Hilbert space on which these operators act. And um, if you look at this question, there's, uh, it's quite straightforward to derive lower bounds on what these values could be. So in the classical case, we find that this value has to be at least the dimension of the system itself. And in the quantum case, we find the lower, uh, lower bound, which says that you'd have to use at least this, you know, sort of the square root of the dimension of the system. And uh, implicitly known um, in, in literature, for example, this paper, is that the first bound is tight. You never need more than um, uh, D unitaries to implement any transition onto systems that could have been possible with an unbounded amount of randomness. And sort of the key result of this first paper is that we show that the second bound is also tight. Meaning that whatever you could have done with any amount of randomness, you can do with a source of randomness that is in a maximum mixed state of the uh, of square root of the dimension of the system itself. And the proof is actually so simple that I will uh, guide you through it, or at least sort of give you a sketch, because it just consists of two steps. Um, the first is to realize that every transition that is possible at all, so every transition that where you know sort of the initial state majorizes the second, the final state, can be implemented by means of the combination of a dephasing channel and the unitary channel. So dephasing channel and some basis uh, is just the channel that maps all the off-diagonal elements in that basis to zero. And whenever you have uh, a transition that is possible, then you can realize this transition by first dephasing the system in some fine-tuned sort of fixed basis and then apply a unitary channel. And this is essentially one direction of this Shohan theorem that people know and love. And uh, so what this means is that if we're interested in bounding and upper bounding the lo lowest amount of, the smallest amount of quantum randomness required to implement any transition, we can simply ask what's the smallest amount that we need to implement this dephasing channel? Because for this unitary channel that I apply later on, I don't need any randomness. And this is uh, also, there's a simple construction for this, um, which um, maybe it's quite elegant. Uh, what you do is you take a unitary operator basis for the um, operator space um, of the ancilla, not of the system itself, right? So something that satisfies this condition here. And uh, you construct this kind of unitary UQ, which will pop up again and again. And then if you apply this unitary to this initial state, then you find that 
locally on the system, you um, deface the system, right? So implementing the defacing channel with quantum randomness is cheap in the sense that you need only very little randomness, in fact, only the square root of the dimension, and you couldn't do less by this lower bound. So this is a tight lower bound. And um, I'm going to now be talking about some applications. Um, the first is once you know that you can implement this defacing channel uh, with very little amount of randomness with a small ancillary system, you can ask, well, what's the smallest possible decohering environment? I mean, the point here is that um, I won't go into detail with, with these applications because there's too many of them. But um, essentially here you can show very simply that an environment, a pure state environment of the same size as the system that you want to decohere is sufficient for the existence of a, of a joint evolution that locally defaces one of the systems, which, I mean, the, the, the evolution is highly non-local. It's not the kind of physical evolution that we think is actually like, responsible for defacing, but it just shows how little and randomness is sufficient uh, uh, to, like, how susceptible quantum systems are maybe to decohering. And in a similar vein, we have this kind of gadgety application where we say, well, what's the smallest possible measurement apparatus? I mean, this is a bit tongue-in-cheek, but you can still make, make a statement once you know that a uh, little environment, a uh, little randomness suffices. Something maybe a bit more substantial is uh, an improved entanglement-assisted private quantum channel that we construct. So what is a private quantum channel? Um, essentially, it's a channel to let Alice and Bob send, securely send um, quantum information. Um, the idea is that you know, Alice has some quantum state and um, they share some classical uh, key, like a one-time pad or something. And then uh, a private quantum channel is essentially, I mean, could be defined in terms of some unitary that has the uh, application, uh, that has the property of um, mapping the system to some constant state, for example, the maximum mixed state, to an outsider, and then um, giving Bob the chance by inversing this unitary to uh, reobtain the ori original information. I mean, it's sort of the, the actual game is more subtle, of course. And um, the classical count here is that there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lower bound. If you have classical, if you only have a classical key, then you need at least twice as many bits of classical key as qubits of information that you want to send over um, in, in, in diamond norm. And uh, Debbie Leung, in, I think, 2004, introduced an entanglement-assisted version of this private quantum channel where she had to use the same amount of EBITs, the same number of EBITs as in the classical version, however now gaining some sort of additional nice properties such as key recycling, um, error correction, and the like. And using uh, this defacing construction of ours and essentially sort of defacing in two mutually unbiased bases, we can sort of half in this count, we can make it optimal in the sense that we can now send two qubits of information securely and reliably over a private quantum channel using two EBITs um, of shared entanglement. And we still have you know, access to these kind of nice properties that the Leon construction had. So, uh, so that's maybe something, something nice. Um, one thing that we don't have in the paper, but that I'm just throwing out here because maybe people are interested in it, there's a, uh, an idea that you could use this defacing construction also in these kinds of mirror tensor networks uh, essentially, this, this defacing would be one of these isometries that you plug into the various bits, and then if you choose uh, suitable disentanglers, then you actually get really interesting entanglement entropy uh, structure at the, at the leaves and so on. So uh, this is not something that has been studied in detail by me or anybody else, I think, but uh, it's maybe something interesting to talk about. So kind of summing up the first part of the talk, uh, what have we done in this catalytic quantum randomness paper? We've studied the amount of randomness required to implement transitions on the noise in some kind of very narrow, specific sense. We've seen that in this particular sense, we gain a, a quadratic quantum advantage by accessing quantum degrees of freedom of the source of randomness. The main tool has been a simple construction of the phasing channel that is optimal in the sense of these entropic bounds. And it's robust, which is something that I haven't talked about, but it's robust in the sense that if your ancilla wasn't actually in the maximum mixed state, but in something different, then we can show that if it's not too far from being a maximum mixed state, you can still um, deface successfully 
And you can, in fact, if you've got a source of just one single state that you'd like to deface, you can sort of accumulate and distill this randomness over time and, and then still get it to do the same job. And it's also robust in time in the sense that if you wanted to sort of implement, um, like generate the evolution that implements this dephasing map by some Hamiltonian, then you don't need full control over the time for you to be able to um, successfully deface. And I've presented a couple of applications. OK, so to now bridge to the second part of the talk, the second paper, um, let me talk about one property that appears in the title of the paper, catalytic quantum randomness, but that I haven't yet mentioned. And that's this catalyticity, which is simply the funny property that if, we, if I take this particular dephasing construction that I've presented to you a couple of slides ago, and I look not at the effect on the system, but kind of the complementary channel, at the effect on the randomness, then I see that regardless of the initial state, the um, state of the source of randomness remains unchanged. So this is interesting, one, because it undermines this you know, sort of mental picture that what we're doing by adding randomness is pumping randomness entropy into the system. That's not what happens. The random somehow comes out of establishing the correlations between the two parts of the system. And operationally, it's also interesting because it allows me to reuse this source of randomness to implement the dephasing again and again and again, an arbitrary number of times. And this has an interesting sort of trade-off that appears. So on the left side, we use our dephasing construction, and we have all of these systems, we dephase them, and then um, I get locally dephased states, but I establish correlations between all of the pairs. On the other hand, I could choose that I don't want that, and therefore I choose a new state of rent, uh, you know, like, um, mixed state of randomness for each of the dephasings I want to do, and then I can do that. I won't have correlations between the, uh, the indi individual copies that I wanted to deface. However, I now had to pay by using more randomness, and having more control over it, and so on. So we became quite interested in this setting here of being able to reuse the system and kind of thinking that in a single shot setting, really the fact that you establish correlations isn't so problematic at all. So it might be, seem a bit unorthodox, um, but, well, it was interesting enough to look at it. And so this is essentially the starting question here um, for the second project, which is characterize the state transitions that you can implement by choosing some <coughs> ancilla and some state sigma and some unitary, which has the effect of bringing the one marginal to a given final state but leaving the other marginal unchanged, exactly unchanged, no epsilons there, right? So it's a really simple problem to, to, to pose. And you know, essentially what we looked at uh, in, the, in, the other, in, the, in the first half of the talk is the, is the case where this is a maximum mixed state, but it need, need not be, right? So which states can be reached if we can choose the catalyst and the unitary? If you look at this, then it's quite simply, simple to see from the subadditivity um, and additivity properties of the phenomenon entropy and the zero ring entropy that necessary conditions for this are that the entropy increase and that the rank increase. And what we were wondering is, are these also sufficient? Can I exactly characterize the possible set transitions by saying that it's possible to get, go from row to row prime if and only if <coughs> the entropy increases and the rank increases? Okay, so this is kind of this question we asked. Why would that be nice? Well, it'd be, be nice primarily because it would give us a single shot interpretation of the phenomenon entropy. So we all know that the phenomenon entropy kind of um, is derived in an asymptotic IID setting, right? And in single shot settings, or like so we have few copies, other entropic quantities, matter, min, max, smooth, and so on. And here this would give us a way where I have a single transition and still the phenomenon entropy is the one and only relevant quantity because the rank constraint is kind of like immaterial. It's not really relevant. And so it would be a really nice way because it's such a simple problem to, to ask and it would be a really nice way to get the single shot uh, phenomenon entropy in there in this way. Uh, why would it be nice otherwise? Well, there's been you know, very influential work by Klimisch and Turgut in characterizing this trumping condition. I mean, people here might, might have known this from sort of these catalytic LOCC operations where, where I kind of 
incre improve or increase the number of state transitions I could implement by giving myself access to catalysts. And so now, sort of generalizing this to the setting where I have correlated catalysts um, and finding this kind of uh, characterization would be a nice overall picture. And in particular, operationally, the interest in doing these kinds of transitions is that there are a whole bunch of transitions that I would become able to implement uh, if I had this knowledge. For example, the state transition that takes me from an initial state to a final state where I kind of um, distill all of the entropy into one subsystem and I have a pure other part, right? So this would be a transition that would become possible by means of a catalyst. And these kinds of transitions are interesting for all kinds of operational uh, tasks, data compression, purity distillation, cooling, and, and the like, right? So I would be, be able to systematically implement all of these by means of additional catalysts. All right, so spoiler is that we don't have the answer. We haven't been able to show that the phenomenon entropy is sufficient, but we have been able to provide a different, slightly more general uh, characterization of the phenomenon entropy single shot uh, that I'm going to present now, and then we also have some, some further evidence of the conjecture being true. And this is what I want to be doing for the rest of, of this talk. All right, so here's a slightly more general setting, right? We split the universe into two parts. I've got my lab, and in the lab I can do everything. I have full control, I can implement any unitary. And then I've got the wild wilderness out there where I don't have control of the system, and so hence the systems will be subject to decoherence in some fixed base, maybe you know the base. And now I'm interested in the transitions and characterizing the transitions from row to row prime such that I can fine tune, uh, I can somehow borrow, borrow a state from the environment that is decohered in a particular basis. I then bring it into the lab. I apply some unitary where I have control. And then I bring the, 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 the ancillary system back However, it need not be in its original state. It may have coherences because these coherences get defaced, get phased out by the environment anyway. So somehow the constraint that the uh, ancillary system has to be returned invariant is relaxed to the constraint that it be just invariant up to coherences. And um, so we do not a state transition to be this if we can find a corresponding unitarian catalyst. And we have a result in that second paper which says that indeed these transitions are characterized exactly by the phenomenon entropy in the rank. Right? So whenever any state row prime that has higher rank and higher entropy, and that could be anything, can be realized by means of such transi transitions. But of course, really, we're interested in the case where you know, we don't have that split of the universe and everything is much cleaner and simpler and um, we, we immediately get the state back. So this is, again, the original picture. And um, we essentially have this conjecture, which now just says that you know, we weren't able to prove it, but we still believe it's true. And we invite everybody here to, to try and to prove it for us, or for them, or for the world. Um, and that's um, to say that whenever two states don't have the same spectrum already, then you can get from one to the other by means of these catalytic correlated operations if and only if the entropy increases and the rank increases. And now, as the last thing, I'm going to present sort of a weak solution of this conjecture that we found, which is the following. I'm just going to maybe state it directly. So essentially, the conjecture is true if I have a given state transition that I want to implement, but I'm now allowed to append a maximum mixed state to it. It just sits there, and it'll be returned in, like, intact at the end. And if I give myself access to that, then I can also show that every transition is possible. Right? So somehow, if this D could be made to be 1, then I would have the con conjecture. But we weren't able to do that. We were just able to show that you know, if you append some, some additional um, system um, in, in this maximum mixed state, then you could show this. Now, this is, you know, well, maybe you think, well, whatever, why should I be interested in this? It's, it's nice for us because it allows us to rule out a lot of other candidate monotones of these transitions. So a monotone 
of this set of transitions would be any function that kind of respects the ordering induced by these transitions, right? So if I'm able to uh, implement this with a catalyst and a unitary, then one sits above the other in this ordering, and a function would just be a monotone of this ordering. And so we have additive monotones, right? That kind of the sum of the uh, terms of a product state. And then using this weak solution that I had on the last slide, we can show that any monotone that isn't somehow equivalent to the phenomenon entropy with respect to this ordering is either non-additive or discontinuous, right? So if there was another monotone that would play the part that we hope the phenomenon entropy plays, it would have to be either non-additive or discontinuous and hence sort of be a pretty exotic entropic quantity. Um, of course, there's the possibility that there isn't a single monotone out there, but it's a, it's a class of functions that together characterize this. Um, but um, this is something we can take out of this weak solution. All right, so summing up the second um, part of the talk, uh, we've given a kind of single shot characterization of the phenomenon entropy using catalysts and decoherence, right? So this is something we could do. And we've uh, sort of postulated this catalytic, catalytic entropy conjecture. Um, we hope you'll all be uh, dropping your work and, and do nothing but work on this. Uh, for the rest of, uh, of maybe 2019. And um, what I haven't talked about are applications. Um, they are, they exist. Uh, in the paper, we talk about catalytic cooling. So it's an alternative to algorithmic cooling where you have a fixed size catalyst that you can reuse again and again to bring an arbitrary number of systems very close to, to being cold. Um, which is unlike algorithmic cooling where somehow the, the, the resources you require are extensive with the number of uh, cool states that you want to produce. However, we correlate these systems, um, the kind of cool systems, in such a way that we don't violate any, any sort of third law type uh, inequalities. And there's actually another paper out by now where we show that using these correlated catalysts, you can circumvent fluctuation theorems in the sense that using catalysts, you can take macroscopic th um, you know, um, thermal states and you can extract uh, work from them in a process um, with, with non-vanishing probability in the system size, right? So this is something that's forbidden by the, um, by the fluctuation theorems and the Dijinsky equality in the standard setting, and we show that using these catalysts you can do that. Uh, so, so that's actually quite interesting from a sort of statistical thermodynamics point of view. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two quick questions. Yes. Um, uh, uh, my, my question is about catalyst. And uh, we, uh, as far as I, as I understand, uh, catalyst is you can use as a resource, and but it's unchanged, and you can use for other. Uh, as many as possible, but in your definition, it is still correlated with uh, with the, the, all, all of these systems. What's the motivation of this behind behind this defi yes. definition? I, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, that's why I call this unorthodox because it goes beyond this sort of catalysis as we know it. And the motivation we have for this is in a single shot setting where I really think about what can I do to change the state of a single system, and I don't care about whether you know, repeating this again and again in other systems produces correlations between them, because it might be that I don't need to bring these two systems on which I acted and on which I established correlations that they ever see each other again. I mean, there might be tasks where this is just too strong to require, right? I mean, I don't know, if I sell, if I sell TVs in my shop and I flip a coin, uh, a single coin at the beginning, and then all of the TVs are broken or not broken. This is not a very good example, but uh, <laughs> then I don't care whether all of my customers are at the same time un unhappy or at the same time happy. Because for each of them individually, um, it doesn't matter locally. The, the, the state isn't changed. Right? This is a very bad example. Um, I understand, but okay, well, I guess but I guess you get just the idea is that these individual copies they don't actually 
have to see each other again, so they don't care about being correlated. And another motivation is that in this paper, Bypassing Fluctuation Theorems, we show that these correlations need not be vicious. You can actually engineer them so that players can sort of use them positively in the sense that they create global work distributions that allow, say, ensure with probability close to one that one half of them gains an activation energy in some kind of thermodynamic process, whereas the other half loses. So they might actually collaborate and use the fact that these correlations are established to their, to their, you know, to, to their advantage. So, so I hope this is kind of a, Thank you very much. the question. Okay, we have time for one more question. Are there Everybody's natural settings in between the classical and the, the uh, quantum setting that you, that you had in the first part of the talk? I mean, there you had the maximal entangled state, right, as a, as a resource. Uh, sorry, the, the maximally mixed state as, as a resource. Is there something natural that you could in, do in between? And uh, I don't really see. I mean, as I said, we have in this paper these results that if the state of the ancilla wasn't maximally mixed, but it was something else, you could still use these constructions to kind of distill the necessary amount of randomness to still dephase your system. However, now, you know, more large and large ancillas. But I couldn't really think of a natural conceptual halfway route between these random channels where you count the number of unitaries essentially and, and simply this one big unitary. I, I wouldn't know what should be in the middle, sorry. Okay. okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank all the speakers of the morning session again.